Okay, hey everyone, and welcome back to CSE 373. In this lecture, we are going to be talking about these things called AVL trees, um, which are this going to be the specific type of binary search tree that knows how to balance itself. So it always has this really nice logarithmic height. We'll get into the details of that later. In this first video, I want to start with some overview of kind of what we're going to be seeing today, including our learning objectives. Uh, before we start, though, I want us to take a second with a bit of a warm up, thinking back to binary search trees. So which of the following properties does the binary search tree invariant create in our binary tree? Take a second and select all the ones that you think the binary search tree property or invariant will give us. Okay, so uh, there are lots of uh, interesting options here. So the first one that we can consider is, does the binary search tree property prevent degenerate trees? And in this case, the answer is going to be, uh, well, whoops, my pen did not, decided not to draw. Go back, try that again. There we go. In this case, uh, the binary search tree property can't guarantee us that the tree won't be a de degenerate tree. The reason is we showed you an example of a binary search tree that is a degenerate tree, um, where all the values going to the right um, were all greater than the previous one. So you can definitely have this kind of chain structure here. Uh, this degenerate tree is a reminder of what we call this. Um, this is totally possible um, with uh, a binary search tree. And similarly to that last point, um, we can't have worst case log n contains key to search our tree for a particular key because in the worst case we have this degenerate tree and we have to search, uh, we're searching for a key that's not there. We're going to have to search through all n values. So we're not going to get that log n lookup. Um, this third one, uh, the binary search tree property only requiring integers is a little bit tricky. We didn't really talk about this. This is also not true. The reason is um, you, you're probably on the right track where you're thinking, well, binary search tree, I need to be able to compare them things to say one is less than or greater than another. Uh, but you might remember from 143 that, at least in Java, we talked about this idea of comparable, uh, some kind of interface or some kind of mechanism for saying this object is less than this other object. So binary search trees don't strictly require numbers. They just require something that's orderable, something that you can compare. And so if this was in Java, that would be the comparable interface. Uh, but pretty much every programming language or computing abstraction has this idea of comparing two things. Now, um, if we think about D, uh, the worst case login contains key when balanced, this is actually going to be true. Now, you might be wondering, what's the difference between B and D? Why is it worst case, why is in B the worst case log n is not true, but in D worst case log n is true? And the idea here is that B and D are just different cases. So in B, we're asking, what is the overall worst case? I didn't add any other qualifiers on the state of the tree. I just, what's the worst thing that could possibly happen? Where in D, I'm saying, well, what's the worst thing that could happen if the tree is balanced? Those are just two separate cases that you could then do a runtime analysis on or um, and then an asymptotic analysis on. So D, it is okay. Uh, we will have this log n contains key if our tree is balanced. Um, and for E, I'm gonna say, we'd say that this is not our uh, best case. Our best possible case so overall um, would be a O of one or a big theta of one runtime. Uh, if we're looking for the key at the top. Um, so again, how you define your cases is pretty important. We can define any set of things we want to fix out besides the input size. Uh, but this is how you go about reasoning about these values. Okay, so I want us to talk a little bit about our learning objectives for today. So today we are going to be focusing on this thing called the AVL tree. Um, we're going to be focusing a lot of our discussion on invariants and how to... Um, define them in a, a way that's useful for our programs. So we're going to continue to be able to evaluate invariants based on their strength and maintainability and come up with invariants for data structure implementations. We're going to our second learning objective is describing the AVL invariant, explain how it affects AVL tree runtimes, and compare it with our binary search tree invariant. 
Her third learning objective is comparing the runtimes of operations on AVL trees and binary search trees. And her fourth is to be able to actually mechanically trace these AVL rotations that we're going to introduce and explain how they contribute to the limiting height of the overall tree. So um, what we're going to start, uh, our kind of journey so far is to try to figure out um, what invariant do we want to make sure that our tree height is reasonable? Um, it's going to end up with this final thing called the AVL invariant, but I want us to explore a little bit how we might start coming up with this idea. Um, why this invariant is the one that we finally stuck with. Um, and then we'll talk about how do you actually maintain it? What are the mechanics of how you implement this thing? So as a bit of review from what we saw last time, we talked about two extreme cases for binary search trees. They could be this perfectly balanced case, this really nice world where everything is balanced on each side, or it could be this degenerate case, you know, the case where all of the children are right children, and then any of your lookups have to do kind of go down this whole link. And so we asked the question, can we do better? Can we improve this worst case, this degenerate case, by somehow limiting the height of the tree? Because we recognize that our runtime for contains key is really limited by the height of the tree. In that balanced tree case, the height is reasonable, but in that degenerate case, to get n nodes in, you have to have a tree of height uh, n minus one. Um, so um, our key observation is if we can limit the height of the tree for a tree of n nodes, then our worst case will be better. And so we're gonna add a new invariant to our structure to make sure that the height is not too long. Now we talked about this a bit on Monday, but I think it's good to kind of go over this again, which is, your first intuition, like, okay, Hunter says I want to limit the height of the tree. I also remember maybe from the tree map implementations and when we talked about uh, binary search trees, that best case, or kind of like that, um, not the best case, but kind of that like really good worst case behavior is big theta of log n. May, and if that's controlled by the height, maybe I could just control the height to be log n. So maybe I can come up with an invariant that says the height of the tree must not exceed log n. Now, I would argue that this is the exact invariant you want. This is the goal. You want to make sure that your tree is not too tall. However, it's really unclear how you're going to make this true. Like when you go insert a node into the binary search tree, so you go find its place in the tree and you add it at the bottom, how can you make sure that this invariant will be held? It's not really clear. This invariant doesn't tell you, oh, this is how you fix this essentially. And so because this lack of clarity, I would argue that it's gonna be really hard for us to come up with a solution that keeps this invariant in an efficient way. There's a really easy way to keep this invariant. Every time you add a new value, completely rebuild the tree from scratch in some way that's balanced. But I would argue that that's gonna be really inefficient. So we're gonna want some way of kind of being able to make local changes to the tree without having to rebuild the whole thing from scratch to keep this goal of keeping a short height. So as a reminder, invariants are tools, tools that we should use to make our lives simpler whenever we're trying to program something. The invariant should be designed in such a way that helps you make your implementation one that works rather than you having to like reinvent the wheel or really figure out how to keep that invariant. So what we're gonna be doing in the next video is we're gonna start by exploring some different invariants that might make sense outside of just this controlling the height to help us achieve this goal before introducing kind of how we're gonna actually solve this problem.